You, eh? How's everybody? Excited to be at church on a fine Sunday morning? Oh, who's pumped for more? I know I am. I've been waiting for this the whole week. Monday, I was ready to go. <laughs> but uh, guys, so good to be with you this morning. I thought I'd start with a little story, which I think you will enjoy. Is that okay? It takes us to the 1300s. Now, that's quite a long time ago, eh, Mark? Oh, okay. <laughs> Roger says it's close to your birthday. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you can take it up with him. But at 1335 to be exact, and what made this year so extreme and such an awesome year, it was the year they had the Archery World Chalice. Not World Cup, because they didn't have cups back then. It was a chalice. And archers from all around the world gathered to see who was the best above the rest. So they blow the trumpets and the tournament begins and they call contestant one to this firing range, shooting line. And they say, sir, what and how far do you want your target to be? So the first contestant, he says, you see the squire? I want you to put an orange on his head and send him out 100 yards and I'll shoot it right off. I feel sorry for the squire. But they send the squire out, he runs, and he puts it, and the contestant, he comes to the line, and he aims. Pew, pew. Straight through the orange. Orange hits the floor. Crowd erupts. Woo! Woo! Contestant number one makes his way to the judge's table. He puts his bow on the table, and he says, I am Robin Hood. And everyone's amazed. They call up contestant number two. And they're like, sir, what do you want your target to be and how far do you want it to go? And he says, take that same squire boy because he's doing such a good job. And I want you to put an apple on his head and send him out 200 yards. 200 yards. And I'll shoot it off his head. So he runs. Now the squire is panicking because it went from 100 to 200 very quickly. And so contestant two, he comes up to the firing line and he aims his arrow. And he lets it pew, pew, straight through the apple. The apple hits the floor. Now the crowd's going even more wild, eh, Steve? Woo, woo, woo! And he comes up to the judge's table, puts his bow on it, and he says, I am William Tull. Don't know if you guys know that, <laughs> who that is. But anyway, third to the firing range is Olfunda Meva. <laughs> Olfunda Meva, he's got his shirt tucked in, and he's ready to rumble. He's like, these guys have got nothing on me. And they're like, sir, what and how far do you want your target to be? And he says, bring that squire boy and send him out 400 yards and put a grape on his head. A grape! <laughs> Orange apple to a grape. And he says, yeah, I'm going to shoot it right off. <laughs> like the crowd can't wait to see this. <laughs> so Van der Merwe, he's there and he's, he's got his bow. But Van der Merwe, he's a little bit more wobbly because he's got 400 meters he needs to cover. And he releases. Pew. Boom! Hits the squire dead middle in the forehead. <laughs> squire drops down dead. Silence breaks out across the whole firing range. People are shocked. I don't know what to do. So Van der Merwe, all he can do is he walks up to the judge's table and he says, I am very sorry. <laughs> 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 you like that one? <laughs> Safe to say he missed though, right? But friends, this morning, if we had to check our own hearts, how many times would you say we've missed the mark? Sure, I changed the atmosphere there quite quickly, eh? Yeah. But how many times have we missed opportunities of obedience towards God's voice? How many times have we missed opportunities to display His glory in all His goodness? Far too many, probably. Eh? But maybe today that can change. Because I don't know if you've noticed, the past few weeks we've been painting this beautiful picture of the love of God. I remember Lee sharing, uh, returning to our first love. Loving God is our greatest commandment. Loving others is a second. In the end, these three remain, eh, Wayne? Faith hope, and love. And Caleb even shared beautifully last week on what it means to love someone that even carries the title of a prostitute. And why wouldn't we talk about love, right? If God is love, do we all agree to that fact? Then it's pretty safe to say that as the Bible, His Word carries the theme of love. 
which is what actually makes loving the easy part. But this morning, I want to go after love's partner in crime breaking, and that is faith. I want to stir our faith this morning, friends, by reminding us of he who we live for, he who we serve, the king above all kings and the Lord above all lords. His name is Jesus Christ. Is there anyone that loves Jesus in the house at church this morning? And the reason I want to do that, friends, is because loving God and loving church isn't enough. We need faith in the room. Because, you know, you can love God and still not believe who he says he is. You can love him and still not believe that he'll do what he says he'll do. The reason I know that is because if we constantly did, surely our lives would look different. Surely we would speak differently, think differently, live differently. There were many occasions where Jesus would turn to his disciples, and you know the saying, you of little faith. He didn't tell them you have little love. John in chapter 3, verse 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes shall not perish. Not whoever loves shall not perish, but, but don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to take away from the bigness of who God is, who is love. I'm trying to stir your faith this morning to believe in his bigness. Faith, lack of faith has caused us to miss out on far too much. It's caused us to miss out on heaven, on earth, the small and big traces of his kingdom. And I don't know if there's anyone here this, else this morning who's here who's tired of missing out. Hey, hey James, you tired of missing out, bro? <laughs> Come on. Lack of faith is caused by a lack of vision or a lack of focus because we can spend so much time looking for that which is visible and miss out on that which is unseen. Because faith doesn't live by sight, it lives by trust in the one who gave it. <laughs> Paul writes this awesome scripture to the church in Galatia in chapter 5 verse 6. He says, the only thing that counts, the only thing that matters is faith expressed through love. In other words, faith expressed through Jesus. How awesome is that, eh? That we get to live such powerful lives. So this morning, we're going to have a look at two stories, if that's okay with you. The first story is going to show us what it means to love God yet lack faith. And the second is going to show us what it means to have both. And what reward awaits us when we get it right. Now, who's excited for that, eh? I'm excited, Steve. Steve's giving me that look like, can't wait for you to bring it, bro. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So our first story is actually going to take us to one of my favorite books in the Bible. And that is the book of John. So if you want to get your Bibles ready, we're going to start reading very soon from chapter 20. The scripture's on the screen, but I know the projector has been giving us a bit of issues, so you might have to bring out the physical copies this morning if it doesn't come on behind me. Book of John, and when we, you'll see it's going to take us to the resurrection of Jesus Christ with some of the disciples and Mary. But there's a few things I like about old Johnny boy. The first thing is he was a really fast runner. He could outrun Peter any day of the week. Or Peter was just really slow, I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe both. I don't know. The second thing I like about old John is the meaning that Jesus gave his name. He actually gave it to him and his brother. He called him a son of thunder. You guys know that? Gave John the meaning, a son of thunder. There's something about this past week that just really emphasized that for me with all our storms that were going on and a bit of hail here in between. But friends, do you know that your name carries meaning and purpose? And God can use you to do remarkable things. And he gives John this meaning, you are a son of thunder, John. And you all know what thunder is. It's the sound that follows, lightning. In other words, it is an echo of power. Huh. Which is why it doesn't surprise me, friends, that in John's gospel, we would see him preaching and teaching a lot about the Holy Spirit, who is our source of power. But the third thing I really like about old John is whenever he would refer to himself in his writings. And I don't know if you've ever read this, but whenever John would write about himself, he would say, the one whom Jesus loved. <laughs> it always has a way of putting a grin on my face. And I don't know what you've ever thought when you've read that line before. You might be like, well, what do you mean, John? Are you, you know Jesus loves us all, right? Are you trying to say you're his favorites or something? No? One whom Jesus loved. I'm sure the disciples love to hear John say that. Hey, 
what's run through your mind when you've read that before? Maybe you've even thought, geez, that seems a little bit arrogant, John. <laughs> pointing out you're the one whom Jesus loves. But the truth is, friends, the fact is that at Jesus' crucifixion, when he was hanging on the cross, all the disciples scattered except one, except John. The one whom Jesus loved. The one who loved Jesus. Because you need to understand this about John, friends. Jesus was more than a teacher. He was more than a way maker, a miracle worker. To John, Jesus was a friend. And you never abandon a friend. <laughs> and we come to this passage of scripture that we're going to be reading in John chapter 20. And we're going to dive right on in. I hope you're ready. From verse 2. Talking about Mary. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, <laughs> and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Verse 9, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So the disciples go to be with the rest of the other disciples, Peter and John. It says they were hiding away in a bit of fear. It also says that Mary was crying outside the tomb. But I want us to just have a look at what John writes here, friends. He says they did not understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. What that tells us is that they had lost faith in Jesus' words of promise. Did they love Jesus? Absolutely. Peter even cut an ear off in passion because, you know, love always protects. <laughs> but they lost faith. And the reason I say that is because if they hadn't, surely their response in this moment would have been completely different. Instead of running to the tomb in desperation, wouldn't they have been running in excitement and anticipation? Oh, I can't wait to see it empty. Instead of Mary crying tears of sorrow, wouldn't they have been tears of joy and rejoicing? Instead of dragging their feet all the way back to the hotel room, wouldn't they have been standing in that tomb shouting, cheering, he did it! He did it! Oh, I know what we should do now. We should stop at Willie's on the way home and get a bottle of champagne to pop with the boys. <laughs> oh, let's celebrate today because the king has risen. But they didn't respond that way. Hey? They didn't respond that way, friends. Had they forgotten what Jesus said to them? That on the third day, he would rise. It's quite an interesting thing, isn't it, friends? Did they really forget what Jesus had said? They've taken him away, they said. <laughs> they've stolen him, they probably thought. <laughs> now, this is actually where it gets quite funny for me because it actually reveals how we think a lot of the time. And I'm actually going to call up my friend Adrian. He's going to come and help me illustrate how bizarre. Can we give it up for Adrian? <laughs> That's right. So the reason this was quite funny for me is because I pictured this moment and I tried to like picture we probably wouldn't be too different in this moment if we were there. And it's these disciples' mindset. So Adrian, don't sit down. Come stand here. Uh, hello, Cam. You can come help us, Cam. Come help us. Okay, awesome. Good job, buddy. So... <laughs> That's okay, I wasn't going to. 
So I actually try to picture this moment in our modern time, and especially with us as South Africans. Now imagine Adrian and I get hired to go and steal a dead body. (laughs) Now any South African, and, and whether you're friend or foe, if we had to stand outside a tomb and look in and there's a dead body lying there, I think we'd have second thoughts. We'd look in there and be like, Aish, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> but anyway, we go in, Adrian, we're going to take the body. You can grab the feet and the head. I'll grab the head, sorry. You can grab the feet, yeah. And we try to carry it, uh, it away out the tomb. Oh, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. You know what I think we should do first? Is I think we should strip the body naked. <laughs> why, why, you might ask? I, I think it'll make it lighter, hey? So can can we just go back in so we can just strip the body and put the linen on the floor? Because it says the strips of linen were lying everywhere. This is how we know it must have been woman thieves, right? (laughs) Oh, no. Sorry, sorry. (laughs) Bad joke. Okay. Oh, Oh, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. One more thing. Just let me just drop the head quick. This is how I know it definitely was woman thieves if it was woman. It's because it said the cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' head was still in its place. So these were quite tidy thieves, trying to tidy up a little bit after themselves. So you can just imagine, I just need to make sure. Wait, there's no time, there's no time. Okay, just the one thing. And then we walk out the tomb with the naked body. Thanks, Adrian. Can we give it up for Adrian? So the Greek actually helps us out here. It says when it was writing, it was still in its place. The Greek meaning is it was either rolled up or still wrapped up. Now you tell me, which is easier to believe? (laughs) That a bunch of crooks would come in, (laughs) but not just steal the body, first like strip it naked, tidy up a little bit, and then make their way out the tomb, or to actually believe Jesus and his words of promise. That who had not only already raised people from the dead, but said he too was going to rise on the third day. Because you need to understand, friends, like a little bit while back, Jesus was ministering and he was praying for people, and he ran into a man named Darius. And this is part of the same story which many of you will be familiar with, with the woman that had the issue with bleeding. Know that story? So in the same moment, woman with the issue of bleeding touches touches Jesus' cloak, gets healed. In the same moment, we have this man, Darius, come up to Jesus saying, my daughter is dying. I need you to heal her. But mid-conversation, some of Darius' friends come up to him and say, your daughter's dead. There's no need to worry the teacher anymore. But as you know, Jesus, he says, take me there now, and I'm going to heal her. And he makes his way to the house, and he's about to make his way upstairs to where Darius' daughter is. And he only takes three disciples with him. And who do you think two of them were? John and Peter. The same two men who would have heard Jesus say to Jairus, do not be afraid, just believe. The same two disciples who would have heard Jesus turn to this woman with this issue of bleeding and say, it is your faith that has healed you. Yet now they're standing in this tomb doubting. Did they forget the past three years of ministry, everything they had seen Jesus do? Had they forgotten that moment with Jairus and the bleeding woman? Had they forgotten that Jesus is a descendant of King David himself? Had they forgotten the young shepherd boy's words, it is not by sword or javelin that the battle is won, for the battle belongs to the Lord. Had they forgotten? David as a young shepherd boy is the second story we're going to have a look at quickly this morning. Because it's David as a young shepherd boy who shows us what it means to love God And have a childlike faith that we should all strive for. Because you all know the story of David versus Goliath, right? Hey? Everyone here? Most of us? Because you can see it, eh? You can see the boxing ring, David versus Goliath. In the left corner, weighing at two million pounds, we have behemoth Goliath. Hope crusher, Philistine skyscraper. And in the right corner, we have little shepherd boy David weighing at two pounds. Oh, I'm spitting now. Now we're getting real. Sticks for arms. (laughs) <laughs> Lion and bear rug connoisseur, you know what I mean? 
So pl- cast your votes. Who's going to win? Because in all honesty, friends, from a glance, we would say David is as good as dead, as dead in this moment, in this picture of him versus Goliath. But it is that which is unseen that can stir faith to see a victory. Hey? Which is why I want us to have a look at young shepherd boy's speech in 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you want to turn there with me. From verse 45, listen to what he says to Goliath. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world, how's that statement, friends? And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he'll give all of you into our hands. Now, isn't that a battle cry speech, friends? Isn't that something we should all write and keep close to our hearts this morning? Hey? But what gave this young shepherd boy so much drive? What gave him so much passion? What made the bears and the lions of the wilderness fear him? What made him step out amongst thousands of men in boldness, declaring that there is one true living God? It was his faith. Because you see, these weren't just words David was speaking. These were words that he believed, and as a result, allowed him to see that which is unseen. It allowed him to see victory. Because I don't know if you've ever noticed this in, uh, in David's speech. I want to just repeat it one more time. From verse 45, he says, But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. To the average soldier there that day on the battlefield, there was one Philistine army, And there was one Israelite army under Saul's leadership. But David says something slightly different. He says, I come against you with the God of the armies of Israel. Last time I checked, armies is plural, right? What do you mean by armies, David? What what are you seeing that I don't see? What do you think he saw, friends? Because you see, it's when we have faith that we start to feel the warmth of the fiery chariot. It's when we have faith that we can start to see heavenly hosts and the trumpets of heaven sounding. The reason I think, and I, no, the reason I believe David saw something far greater that day is because who taught him all of this? Who taught young shepherd boy David to be so bold and courageous to know that there's this one true living God? He was a shepherd boy, sending sheep out in the fields. Wasn't his dad, Jesse, or his older brothers who so eagerly tried to belittle him on every occasion? So who taught him? Friends, can I tell you, David had a relationship with our Heavenly Father. He knew what it meant to spend time with him on a daily basis. Which is why when he came face to face with the bear or lion, he didn't have a single drop of fear in his heart. Because he knew who the battle belonged to. You see, the giant isn't so big, friends, when you look ahead to he who is far bigger and far greater. What made David's faith so powerful is that he never lost sight of the fact that the battle belongs to the Lord. Never lost focus. Which is why, if I may, I'd like to change the way you view the story slightly, because it isn't so much a story about David versus Goliath. It's a story about God focus versus giant focus. Because when we focus on God, we invite heaven down to earth. When we don't, we find ourselves crying outside an empty tomb, hiding away in a hidden room. (laughs) And we don't want that, do we, friends? As a young shepherd boy, David got this so right, believing in God, as a young shepherd boy, but as he got older, he didn't always get it right, did he? If you know the story, I'm not going to dive into that too much, but if you go and read it for yourself, as David got older, he stumbled here and there. 
And it's through him we are taught this incredible lesson, friends. When David focused on God, giants fell. When he didn't, he did. Can I say that again? Because that's, that's big. When David focused on God, giants fell. When he didn't, he did. And I don't want the same for you, friends. It's time for faith to rise. And then we come to Jesus. The one who conquered the grave. The way maker, miracle worker. King of kings, Lord of lords. The one who conquered the grave, who lived the sin-free life, all because he didn't lose focus for a single second. He didn't lose focus of his heavenly father. His glorious face and his glorious voice. Because he knew without him he could do nothing. Which is why I want to say and encourage you this morning, friends, whenever you face challenges in this life, I want you to remember, it's not you versus fear. It's God-focused versus fear-focused. It's not you versus depression. It's God-focused versus depression-focused. It's not you versus sickness. It's God-focused versus sickness-focused. Because you see, the devil's naughty. (laughs) And he's clever too. Because he wants to take your faith, your belief in God, and turn it into a lie, belief towards him. And before we know it, we empower the very thing we were given the power to overcome. But enough is enough. Enough is enough. Because I want to tell you, no matter what you might face, God is greater. He is bigger because the battle still belongs to him to this very day. So who are you going to focus on? Who do you choose to fix your eyes on? Because it's time to see through eyes of fire. Because when we do, we don't only see differently, we think differently and we live differently, even if we find ourselves standing in a tomb. Even if we find ourselves standing in a tomb. Now, you might not know this, but my wife is an incredible designer, fashion designer. She's the best. There's no one better. Even making Aaron's wedding dress. Come on. (laughs) But I've seen some spectacular things come out of her studio. Matric dance dresses, uh, pageant dresses, wedding dresses. You name it, she can do it. I've seen them glitterified. I've seen sequins. I don't think there's been one day I haven't walked out the house with a sequins on my ankle or something. (laughs) It's everywhere. It's on our couches. It's on the bed. It's everywhere. It's just, it's like invaded. But the one thing I've never seen come out of her studio is grave clothes. I've never seen grave clothes come out of her studio. Garments which people would use to wrap dead corpses. Why would I? (laughs) That's not really something we want to make or wear, is it? Grave clothes? But for the first time in history, Jesus takes the burial garments, that which would be used to wrap dead corpses, which to John, Peter, and Mary look like tragedy. Because you've got to see it, friends. The disciples gave up their careers to follow Jesus. They gave up everything. Heck, a week ago, they were parading him. As he entered the city, the king has arrived. But it was these very same people who would hang him on the cross, shouting, crucify him. And now they're standing in this tomb, surrounded by linen on the floor, their Savior gone, their future, their friend. But for the first time, Jesus takes their tragedy and he turns it into triumph. Do you believe he can do the same for you? I hope that I've stirred your faith to say yes. I hope I've stirred your faith to say yes. <laughs> he can take a symbol of death and turn it into a symbol of life. How amazing is that, friends? I'm going to call up my friend Caleb to start playing some keys for me in the background as we slowly finish off. It says that the cloth that was wrapped around his head was still in its place. 
friends, can I tell you this morning, Jesus is still in his place. Jesus is still on the throne. The one who came to serve and not be served is still head of the church. The reason we call the helmet the helmet of salvation is because Jesus is the head of the church, the source of our salvation. And it is because Jesus is the head of the church, we can experience perfect order and breakthrough at the same time. Do you see that, friends? We can experience perfect order and breakthrough at the same time because Jesus is still the head of the church. Love and faith, eh? It's our love that helps keep us around. Our passion, our desire for God. Because at any point, David could have left that battlefield. No, this is too big for me. And he could have ran away. But because he loves God so much, he stands there and he says, I dare this Philistine insult my God. At any point, John could have left the cross. But his love for his friend kept him around and it is faith where we see the giant fall it is faith where we see the dead rise 